I'm Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel and mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O
Lord, we do. We love you. We worship you. Lord, we're here to honor and glorify you. Lift up your name, Lord. There is no one worthy of the praise that you are worthy of, Lord. No one. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people try to convince us. No one is worthy outside of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for allowing us to be in this place this morning and to lift our voice to worship and praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, I pray that you would move in this place today. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified and honored in every way, shape, and form today. God, I pray that you would speak to your people today. Lord, I pray for healing today. Lord, there are so many that are sick and down in various ways, Lord, colds and flus and all that stuff is going around. Lord, I think of Barry who's still dealing with his digestive issues and pray that you would minister to him. Lord, I think of Carmen who was at the ER again earlier this week. Lord, would you speak to her and minister to her body? Lord, I know some absent from service today because they're under the weather and feeling ill. Lord, would you minister to people's lives? Would you bring healing and wholeness, not just in the physical sense, but in the mental, emotional, spiritual sense as well, Father God? Touch the lives of your people, Lord Jesus. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I would normally at this point in the service, I'm out in the back with the kids doing a kids' church. So we have a few kids here today. Would like to invite you up for a kid's message. Come on, Brian, I see you. I have a prize for you. I have a prize for all the kids that come up. There might be just a couple, that's okay. You're going around the long way, that way. <laughs> there we go. Hey, how are you? You want to have a seat right there? All right. All right, so today we gather uh, during the special ad season of Advent, and I don't know if we know what Advent is, but we're going to learn every week about what Advent means, and uh, we'll be talking about all the beautiful things, and today our theme is hope. Hope is like a light that helps us see through the darkness. Do you have a flashlight when you go out to the, or you borrow your mom's phone or your grandma's phone, flip on the light, and you can go out and you can see, that's what like hope is, so we can see through darkness. And we get glimpses of things and we use the light. We'll say, oh, that's a good thing over there. I can see in the dark. So it reminds us of good things to come. So I'm going to be lighting a candle today. See the candles there? Yeah. And uh, the first candle symbolizes hope. And as the flame flickers, I want you to think about what hope means to you. So give me just a second here. learn why not the pink one on another week, okay? So when we come in next week, we're going to see this one purple candle lit already, that we've already experienced what hope is. Isaiah 9, 2 says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And so during Advent, we're going to focus on waiting for the light of Christmas, the birth of Jesus, who brings hope into our life. So this week, I want you to think of of, of things that bring you hope during Christmas, okay? Do you know one right now? What brings you hope during Christmas, Ron? Uh, presents. The hope of getting presents, okay. Family. Family. That's right. Well, you know what? The hope of getting presents is true, too. I mean, we all like a gift. But we know, we, we know what the gift is. So, um... So what about you out there? Something come to mind? Lean to your neighbor right now and tell them one thing. One thing that reminds you of hope. OK. 
Okay, tell your spouse that next to you. <laughs> Peace. All right, that's good. There's not a wrong answer, really. What brings you hope? And that's, and that's Jesus. So we're going to bow our heads and say a quick prayer, and I have a, a present for you to take back, and I'll show you what it is after we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that Christmas brings. And help us be light of hope to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, I have this, where is it? We have these little DIY, we love like making our own stuff, don't we? We do. So see this? Pastor Kurt made this. What did that look like? A reindeer what? Like a door thing. You could. This is a little wreath. We're going to call it the wreath of hope. But yours might look better than that. Oops, sorry. Pastor Kurt put that together real quickly for me. Here's your own. There's one and there's one. Any of the tweens want one? Yes, they do. <laughs> Would you take this to Miss Kathy? Take this to Brooklyn. You can have one for your grandma. Yes, sure. I'm Okay, you can go back. Thank you so much for coming up. Where is Kane? Huh? I should give you the one that Pastor Kurt made for him. No, here. There you go. Thank you. Go back. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Thank you so much, Best Kurt. Okay, it should not be hard, but your goal is to make that wreath look nicer than the one I did. Mine was not looking very good. I started putting it together, and I'm like, oh, that, that, that's kind of sad. I didn't real that every night. Doesn't matter. I might have to redo that later. Or I'll give it to Jody. She'll do a better job than I will. <laughs> well, here we are. <clears throat> Just as promised. We have entered the Christmas season. Although I hope we understand it's not really just a season. We call it that. We refer to it as that all the time. We even do it as believers. But this is supposed to be something we celebrate continually. Not just for 30 or 45 days or as the stores would have you do, 90 days. It's a time we're supposed to celebrate all year long. Even though we refer to December as the season. There are some things we do different, though, this time of year, typically. And again, we do it too, not just the world. There are things like different songs we sing at this time of year. Some people say not till after Thanksgiving. Some people start it in June. Whatever the case might be, we have different songs we typically sing. You heard a few of them this morning. Well, most of those songs will focus on the birth of Christ, or at least most of the older songs will focus in on the birth of Christ, His arrival here on earth. Now, I can't speak to a lot of those modern songs or the more current songs because they speak about a lot of different things. But older songs will speak to the, to the birth of Christ. And believe it or not, Many of those carols, many of those songs have their basis in Scripture. They talk to us about the Word of God. So we thought maybe we would take a closer look at some of those songs this year and how they link back to Scripture. Perhaps we'll get a fresh perspective on what it is we're singing and the worship that we're doing. Perhaps it'll give us a little bit deeper insight on those songs and to the Scripture that they connect us to. So the first song we're going to take a look at. The first song was written in 1865. And it was set to the tune of a then traditional English folk song. 
This particular song starts by asking a question. Now, I would hope for most of us it's a rhetorical question, but nonetheless it starts by asking a question. And then it ends with praise and worship. At the time the song was written, William Chatterton Dix was working as a manager of an insurance company. He was 29 years old when he was afflicted with an unexpected and severe illness that resulted in him being bedridden and suffering from severe depression for a period of time. It was his near-death experience that brought about a spiritual renewal in his own life. And during his recovery... He started reading Scripture more and more. It was at that time that he was inspired to author several, several different hymns and worship songs, including the one we're going to talk about here in a minute. Although this particular song was written in 1865, it was not published until 1871, almost six years later before it actually uh, was published. At that time, it was featured in a Christmas carol old and new collection in the UK. And at that time, it was part of the new collection, not part of the old as it might have been today. In part, some of this song was based on a scripture that Pastor Brian read for us already this morning. It's a scripture that's very familiar to most of us. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. About that particular text, one commentator says this. He goes, have you ever realized just how strange these words are? At first glance, the grand titles and expectations seem absurd to be placed on a child. It's a strange picture, if you will. A small child hunched over like Atlas and a parliament building set on his shoulders wearing some sort of a crown perched on a throne with a very troubled look on his face as if to say, what in the world am I doing here? Think about it. If we didn't know better, a quick glance at that Scripture would give us that kind of image. Yet this is exactly what these verses tell us to be true. And of course, there was no actual building, no real uh, throne, and no crown other than the one of thorns that this baby was indeed holding on to for all of us. The thought still is amazing to us. This child, this baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would be the fulfillment of these promises. He would be and is the wonderful counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, that not only we celebrate in this season, but is something every one of us desperately need. It was an astonishing prophecy that was fulfilled in Christ, but it kept in mind the question, which is the title to the song, What Child Is This? If we were to head downtown Chicago and conduct a little on-the-street interview with some people and ask that very question, what child is this? Can you imagine some of the responses we might get? Popular culture today would say, well, he's a baby in a manger and probably became a very nice man. 
As long as he keeps his distance and doesn't bother me in my life, we're good. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? But that's popular culture today. That's a response you might hear today. If we met with somebody from the Islamic faith, they would tell us that Jesus was an incredible prophet. But that's all he was, was a prophet. There was no crucifixion. There was no death and resurrection. He was just a prophet. If we ran into a psychologist, we might hear them say, well, Jesus taught us about relationships. He taught us how to be nice to other people, how to relate to other people. If we talked to a merchant, we might hear him say something like, I don't really care. As long as my bottom line is 5% above where it was last year, we're good. Those are the kind of responses we might get if we went downtown and asked that simple question, what child is this? See, this is an age where Christmas has become sanitized. It's been cleansed of all kinds of things. See, people today are looking for a non-offensive Jesus, a non-intrusive Jesus, and therefore they're looking for a non-effective Jesus. That's what's on people's plates today as they celebrate this season that we have entered. They want Jesus to be more like a book, something you can take down off the shelf, read a few pages, and when you're no longer interested, you put it back on the shelf and let it collect some dust. That's what people look for today. So how are we going to find out the answer to that very simple question? What child is this? Let me ask you, do we start at the manger? No. That's really not where we should start. Let me give you an example. If you wanted to study and find out and know about who Abraham Lincoln was, where would you start? Would you pass around baby pictures? Would you go to the log cabin where he was born? Would you find out about his mom and dad and what happened at the time of his birth? That's not going to get you the answer you're looking for. That's all great and wonderful and important stuff. And it's all relative to Abraham Lincoln in general. But that's really not going to tell you who he was, what kind of person he was, what he represented. Would you look at his career? Look at his character. Look at what he accomplished. Look at who he was as a person way past the point of his birth, that's where you're going to find out about who Abraham Lincoln was as a person. And it's quite the same for our Jesus. There's a lot of importance about the manger. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of pertinent information there. There's a lot of fulfillment of prophecy there. But looking at Christmas in itself, that little scene, that little story, that little time in the manger, isn't really going to give you a great picture of who Jesus is. You've got to look ahead a little bit. So in order to do that, we're going to go all the way to the end of Scripture. Revelation chapter 22. And there we're going to hear a little bit more about who Jesus is. In fact, Jesus Himself says, this is who I am. He gives us a description of Himself. Chapter 22. The first verse we want to look at is verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. This child, this precious little baby that we celebrate in that manger. Typically we picture it full of hay and in that little wooden structure, that little baby is the beginning and the end. He's the start. He's the finish. That baby lying in that manger is absolutely everything. 
I read something this week, and, and I, I can't say it was, it was horribly profound, but it was presented in a, in a way I hadn't really zoned in on before, so it kind of got my attention. It was a real simple statement, but think about this. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. That first, who is the creator of all things, created that manger in which He lay. I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective before. He made those animals. He made all of that which would surround Him on that day of His birth. Let's move forward a little bit. Still chapter 22. Look now at verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent My angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Interesting there. Testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Let's ponder this for just a minute. I'm the root and the offspring of David. What in the world is he saying there? How can he be both? How can he be the root of David and yet the offspring of David? He is in in essence saying, I am a descendant of David's, but I'm also David's father. Wrap your head around that for a minute this morning. I am the root of of David. I am, I am where he, David, started. Think about that. That, That's got to make an impression on us this morning. Not only is he saying, I am the root and the offspring, Jesus here is confirming the fulfillment of yet another prophecy. See, the only way he can be both the root and the offspring is because He fulfilled the prophecy of the Incarnation. Because He was born exactly as Scripture said He would be born. He was at the beginning of all things. Genesis 1.1, pick up Scripture and read it. Jesus is there at the creation of everything. Jesus is there. He is part of of the beginning of all Scripture, which means He is also part of creation of man and the creation, therefore, of David. David's father, if you will. Then He was born. He became man. He came to this earth as one of us. He took on human form. And He did that, we know, through Scripture as the son of Mary and Joseph. If you look at Mary and Joseph's lineage, this is how well God does all of this. If you look at Mary and Joseph's lineage, both of them can be traced back to David. Not just one side, both sides can be traced back to David, who Jesus says, I'm the offspring of David. So he is both the root and the offspring, as he says in Revelations 22, 16. Let's look at it again, because there's another clue here in that same verse, Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus said, I am the bright and morning star. Now, it's easy to know, it's easy to understand that He is the creator of the stars. If you believe Scripture, if you believe that He created all things, if you know that text and stand on it, and Jesus was at the beginning doing the creating with the Father, then He created all the stars, right? But there's also a reference to this in the Old Testament. Numbers 24, verse 17 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Again, another 
prophecy fulfilled through Jesus. He is that star that would rise up. That star also references His kingship. He was born to earth. He was born as a man. But that star is a representation of kingship, of deity. We see once again, Jesus, fully man, being born as that little baby, but also fully God, the deity, the bright, the morning star. In essence, with that text in Revelation, he is announcing the dawn of his coming, the bright and morning star. As believers, I hope that we truly understand who the child is that we celebrate as Christmas. Because He truly is our everything, folks. Absolutely everything. Not what most people would say today. Not what most people would think about today. You heard some of those other descriptions and that is reality. That is what people might say about who Jesus is, about who the child is. Going forward in this season of our life this year, when we sing those words, what child is this who's laid to rest? Or why does he lie in such a mean estate? Remember who it is we are singing about. Remember who it is that has sacrificed Himself for you and for I. That precious little baby. We think He's all soft and cute lying in that manger and we forget about what a horrible death He suffered for you and for I. Think about it as you sing that song this season. Proclaim it to people this season. Tell them that it is your Lord who will reign forever and ever and ever that is laying in that little manger that's sitting on somebody's mantle or out in front of somebody's house or, or wherever you see it. Proclaim it this year that you know who that little baby is. You know who that child is. Don't let them guessing, but tell them who this child is to you. And I pray, I absolutely pray that this baby is your Alpha and your Omega. That you know Him as the root and the offspring of David. That He is for you the bright and morning star. And perhaps even more importantly, I pray that He's your Savior. I pray that He is your absolute everything. So as we embark on this sacred journey through the season of Advent, we find ourselves standing at the threshold of hope. Advent with its four candles symbolize hope, peace, joy, and love. And it beckons us to reflect on the profound significance of each element. And so today, our focus is on hope, the first flicker of light that pierces the darkness of anticipation. The hope in its purest form is the eager expectation of a promise fulfilled. The assurance that dawn will break after a long, dark night. So I looked up the simple definition of what the word hope means in the Cambridge English Dictionary. It's really easy. It's defined as to want something to happen or to be true. So in the season of waiting... Our hearts echo the sentiments of ancient Israel yearning for the promised Messiah. 
And what better encapsulates this collective longing than the timeless hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Its haunting melody and poignant lyrics have traversed the centuries and echoed the anticipation of generations who awaited the arrival of the Savior. So we're going to walk through the corridors of hope guided by the verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And as we do this, but too many pages. Sorry. So as we do this, what will we do? We're going to unwrap the layers of the cherished hymn. And I, I just want the flames of hope to burn brighter and brighter in your hearts and in mine. And that it will illuminate our path through this Advent season and it'll lead us to the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest longings. So in the grand symphony of salvation history, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel emerges as a profound anthem of anticipation, weaving together the threads of the Old Testament prophecies and the timeless truths of God's redemption plan. So we're going to consider these opening lines of the hymn. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. We sang this earlier. So these words echo not only the sentiments of what the Israelites were yearning for in a Messiah, but also the very heart of God revealed in the prophecy of Isaiah. So in Isaiah 7:14, the Lord promised a sign, a virgin conceiving and bearing a son, the Emmanuel, God with us. And this hymn captures this anticipation in a beautiful way. It abridges the ancient prophecies with our modern contemporary hearts. Doesn't it? When you've heard that song, it's like it just grabs you and you can relate to it. So as we meditate on this plea, O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirit by thine advent here and disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. So we're reminded of Isaiah's proclamation in chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light and those who dwelled in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. So the day spring, the light of the world was breaking through the shadows of sin and despair. So I think we can appreciate the historical context of this hymn. It originated in the 12th century as a series of anthems and it was normally sung during the seven days preceding Christmas. So O Come, O Come, Emmanuel served as a musical journey to the prophecies of the Messiah. So each verse addresses the promised Savior with a different Old Testament title like Wisdom, Adonai, Root of Jesse, Key of David, Dayspring, King of Nations, and Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this hymn connects generations to the timeless story of God's faithfulness. So I'm going to go back to Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And we're going to find a description of the promised Messiah. Four to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called, will be called the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. And as I read that, I'm sure each of us have a different a hymn or carol or Christmas song that comes to mind because of these words are used over and over and over. This hymn aligns with the prophetic vision capturing the multifaceted nature of the anticipated Savior. 
So I'm going to go to the back of the Old Testament in Micah, Micah 5.2. We encounter the prophecy about the birthplace of the Messiah. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origin are from old, from ancient times. So this hymn, with a reference to Emmanuel, God with us, reinforces the significance of Bethlehem as a birthplace of the incarnate God. So we're going to look in Re Revelations 1, 1 8. Um, it's the crescendo of, of what's happening. And we hear Jesus declaring his eternal nature and authority, which Pastor Kurt already said. We did not compare notes. Maybe we should have. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, this hymn resonates with this proclamation portraying Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, embodying the fullness of God's redemptive plan. So, as we approach the celebration of Christ's birth, let the truth be embedded with these words, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let it resonate deeply within us. The historical event of Jesus' birth is the fulfillment of God's divine plan. And the promises of old will find the realization in the manger of Bethlehem where our Emmanuel, our Emmanuel, your Emmanuel, God with us, God with me, God with you, shall come to thee, O Israel. It's just not a declaration of things in the past, but a proclamation of eternal hope. And as believers, we can stand on that truth of hope, that Christ is going to come back again someday. It could be now. It could be this, this could be this holiday season. We don't know. But during this wait, let our hearts resound with joy and let our lives bear witness to the transform transformative power of, the, of, of our Savior. And that our hope needs to be anchored in the promise that Emmanuel, God with us, is with us. Amen? Not only yesterday, but today and forever. So we need to rejoice for Christ has come. And he's going to come again bringing everlasting hope to all those who believe my question to you are you ready to receive this hope those sitting here today those who are watching right now live those who are watching maybe next week are you ready to receive the hope of Christ oh come oh come Emmanuel O come, O come, Emmanuel. In modern days, God with us, please, please come back. Come take your people back home. Back home. We're ready. We're ready. The earth is groaning. The earth is just moaning. There's wars and rumors of wars. There's so many things going on all around us. But don't despair. We have so I'm going to lead in that hymn once again. These altars are open. If you would like to rekindle your relationship with that hope, with Emmanuel, God with us, these altars are open. And those who are home watching, God is with you. And the altars are open.
ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice! Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to sad division sees and cause us in her way to go rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to the Oh, come and 